recording the session, please feel free to keep your videos on because it's lovely to see your faces. Um, but if you're worried about that, like Kathy um, sitting in a hotel room, um, turn them off and, and if everyone can mute themselves, Bridget will be managing the, the muting and the chat. So welcome to our third um, Australasian Women in Emergencies Network conversation for 2021. Um, I start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we are all meeting today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I always like to pay particular respect and acknowledgement to the traditional custodians, the Wurundjeri people um, who've looked after the Dandenong Ranges where I live so well for so long and I'm grateful to have this place to call home now. Um, Fern Hames. I met Fern only a few months ago actually um, at the Hillsville Hotel over a glass of lemonade and I think it was maybe an eggplant parmigiana um, and that was regarding a project that we're collaborating on around nature-based community recovery which is really interesting. Uh, we'll tell you a bit more about that during the conversation. First I'm delighted to tell you a little bit more about Fern. So Fern is the science manager communication and collaboration at the Arthur Ryler Institute for Environmental Research in the Biodiversity Division, Environment and Climate Change at the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. That is ridiculous, Fern. I would like to see your business card. <laughs> so yeah, Arthur Ryler idea. Institute is the research arm of the Department of Environment here in Victoria. Fern's role at the Arthur Ryler Institute um, is about connectivity. It's about connecting new science knowledge, delivery partners and the community. These connections mean that ARI's research can truly help guide and guide on ground actions, underpin policy decisions and democratize science. I love that. Fern's interest in such connections began when her biology research background evolved into people focused engagement, citizen science and education. In emergency contexts, she has had formal roles in incident management teams and delivered longer term programs connecting fire affected communities with the recovery of nature and supporting the powerful two way recovery loop that can develop for the benefit of both people and nature. She leads the Victorians Value Nature Program for Dell and the nature led community recovery bushfire recovery program and is increasingly interested in behaviour change in the context of people nature connections and the role of nature in supporting human recovery. Her work in this area has been recognised in several ways, including very recently receiving a public service medal just this year, and, and, and Fern showed us that recently in another meeting. So congratulations, Fern, on that very prestigious award. Fern also has a rich volunteering history featuring Antarctica, Tanzania, Myanmar and Pakistan, and ranges across science, leadership and community capacity. So we are really delighted to have Fern speaking with us today. So welcome. Fern, if I can start with a question. Um, here you are um, involved in, in bushfires, community recovery and engagement and nature. Um, could you just tell us how you ended up here? What, what, what things led you to where you are today? Mm, well, first of all, Thank you for having me here. Thank you. It's lovely to see you. And I'm also joining you from Wurundjeri country today. So pay my respects. Um, it's a really complicated answer, actually. <laughs> and sometimes I say to people that uh, my journey in the things that I've explored has meandered. We just lost you for a sec, Fern. Um, let's just persevere and see how we go. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we've got you now. So you said you've meandered like a river. Yes. <laughs> so I originally began as a research scientist uh, studying freshwater fish, studying everything I could about a particular species of freshwater fish. And I loved it. And I learned a lot about scientific method, research method. Um, I also learned Oh no. We've lost you, Fan. I'll try turning my camera off and see if Yeah, I maybe we'll do that. Yep. Okay. So gotcha. let me see if this works better. And I'm sorry that you can't see me. Um, but let me say that originally I started off as a research scientist studying freshwater fish. 
studying everything about them and also thinking about how we apply that science. And it became ever <laughs> uh, we've lost you again, Fern. So for those, those of you listening, Fern is actually in her office. Um, Can I suggest if, if Fern out. turns off her camera, which means we can't see her, which she is sad, been. but we'll she be able to hear her then. She's turned off her camera. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I might try and just move it to a different part of my desk. Like... Let me see if it makes any difference. I can't imagine that it will. But, um, I love technology. Just going to unplug something and put it back in again. Hang on. All right. I haven't got any stories to fill in. All right. I, let, I do. I'll tell you. I've just come back from Tasmania where I did a, um, a trek in the Tarkine Forest in northwest Tasmania as um, part of uh, an initiative with the Climate Council. So I was very lucky to be trekking with Professor Leslie Hughes, who's been one of our um, speakers on the Oil Conversation in the past. So for a week, I trekked with 18 other um, climate conscious people from around Australia in some of the wildest and most pristine rainforest in the world, they say, some of the most untouched forests. It was absolutely amazing. We had a couple of days of sunshine and climbed some peaks and enjoyed the sun. And then we had a couple of days in true rainforest style, trekking all day in the pouring rain, complete with soggy shoes and river crossings. But um, the guide that I was talking with, right at the back, because all the photographers were at the back and others were marching along in front. We, we went on fungi expeditions, so I know a lot about fungi now. But she said some of the walks that we were doing um, are very rarely touched and visited. So um, to be in one of the remotest places on earth at a place where very few people actually go to was really quite amazing. And to link that through to the, um, yeah, the, the climate change story, um, we really need to be doing something. And I'm, I'm I've come back feeling a little bit desperate and um, feeling very proactive. So for those that are here, be ready to hear a little bit more about women in emergencies and potentially setting up a, I haven't spoken to Bridget about this yet, but maybe a climate change sub-chapter so we can um, actually rally the forces and, and make the conversation louder because we are running out of time. How did you go, Fern? Well, I've, um, I've taken everything out and put everything back in again. All right. So, <laughs> so try again and tell us how you got here. <laughs> Let's try Wave at me if it's not working, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not working. Bar thing says it's perfect. Why is it not working? Try again. Try again. Okay. Maybe I'll just move on from. Maybe it's about phone question. option. Yeah. Let me let me try and use my phone. Hang on. Okay. Thanks for your patience for those that have called in. I'm so sorry about this. Um, I don't I don't really have a backup plan. That's really poor emergency planning, isn't it? Anyone who knows me well will know that I'm not very good at planning. I'm much better in a crisis. <laughs> Let me try this. Hang on, I'll, I'll, turn, it, I'll turn it off there. Yep. <laughs> okay. We can hear you. Try again. I'm just going to disconnect from the screen version. Yeah, and Bridge, you might be able to. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, it's fabulous. Let's go. Oh, fabulous, let's try this. Okay, and it look, it's a bit weird because joining from my phone is just not the same thing. I can't see all your faces so well, but. <laughs> well, let me just tell you, we all look gorgeous. <laughs> Let's um, practice our resilience muscle, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
so I started off in freshwater fish. It was really narrow. I just thought, no, it's just not connected with the systems in which fish live and breathe and operate. And it, it just, I needed more connections. So I actually left that work after seven years of quite intensive research into genetics, nutrition, photo period, all sorts of things. And um, I joined a not-for-profit organisation running remote expeditions into the centre of Australia, Australia's wet tropics and the southern parts of New Zealand and a little bit in India. And those scientific expeditions were multidisciplinary. So we looked at a range of different things, including, you know, the plants, the animals, including birds, fish, bats, insects, discovered new spiders, discovered a whole lot of archaeological things, worked with Aboriginal people, did a little bit of story, did all sorts of things out in the desert, out in the wet tropics. And we brought specialists with us, so experts who led each group, but we also brought ordinary people who were just interested. And this was actually, you know, the beginnings of what we now call citizen science. And I found it an incredibly powerful experience. And it was powerful for the people who were participating because they got to really genuinely and meaningfully connect with place, connect with science. That democratising science idea was really evident for us then. And I could see that this was a powerful way to connect people with science, nature, place and processes and each other. And uh, I stayed there for quite a while and then... On one of my last trips, one of the old Aboriginal ladies came up to me and she patted me on the arm and she said, oh, you're not coming back next season. I said, of course I will, Jessie. I'll be back next year. I'll see you in May. And she said, no, nah, no, nah, you're not coming back for a long while. And what I didn't know, but Jessie apparently did, was that I was actually pregnant and I did not come back for some years because I went and had small children that were hard to take into the desert for you know 10 weeks at a time but Jessie said to me at that time but you will come back because you have slept under the silver moon in the desert and the moon has tied a silver thread to your heart and it will pull you back and you will feel that pulling you back to the desert because it's now part of you wow and that, it deeply resonated with me and it it was true because the desert has kept pulling me back again and again and again over my life. And it has made me really contemplate what are the things that connect people to place and nature and the environment. After that work, I took, um, you know, I had children. I got a lot of other part-time roles in things like policy, tertiary education, um, managing environmental water for farmers to most make effective use of water, a whole lot of other things like that. And then I became in, involved in a role coordinating the research of the Native Fish Strategy, which was a Murray-Darling Basin Authority strategy. I coordinated the Victorian research and had a big role in engagement of that research. So we had this sort of three-phase thing for that work called research, partnerships and action. So it was a big part of my role to work with that research with river communities and help them understand the research that was relevant for the river communities and the fishers that they lived with and to get them involved in it and to build their advocacy as well. And I became known as the fish lady, and <laughs> which was a funny kind of title, but um, I was okay with that. And I loved that role. I, I loved it almost as much as when I was going out in the desert and doing the stuff, um, stuff out there, because I got to work really closely with a whole range of different people, exploring new science, applying that science and connecting people with their rivers. Now, while I was doing that work, um, because I was working for a precursor to DELP, I had a fire role. So I was you know, regularly every summer involved in fires. And then um, 2009 came along, Black Saturday. And uh, although I said to you at the start of this, I was coming to you from Wurundjeri country, and, and I am because I'm in Heidelberg today, I also live part of my time in Alexandra, which is half an hour from Marysville. And for those of you who you know, are familiar with the history of fires in this country, you will know that Marysville has a, a particular place in our history of fire. And in 
Black Saturday, when 173 people died, Mary's Fall was a focus for many of that, much of that trauma. Most of the town was destroyed. Many people died, including people that I know well. Many of the land park, landmarks that are part of my life and history disappeared. Uh, it was a traumatic event for people and communities that I know and love. It was also traumatic for fishers. It was also traumatic for all the aquatic life, well, not just aquatic life, of course, but because I was the fish lady, that's what I was particularly mindful of. It was an enormous event for all kinds of environmental impacts, habitats, flora and fauna within the fire footprint. Now, we had been... Um, we had been working with various communities in that part of the world around getting them connected with their fish community before the fires. When the fires came along, um, we wanted to go and rescue some of those fish. And perhaps I should take a sideways step here and describe to you what happens when a fire, a massive fire like that hits a river. So the impact is not so much the fire although I have been to small streams after fires and seen cooked yabbies in them. So hot water can be a real problem for aquatic creatures. But the main problem is after the fire. So after the fire, when the first rains come, they wash masses of silt and ash into those rivers. And if you can imagine a layer of sludge that can be up to your thigh deep, that completely smothers so many things that are important in the aquatic life in that stream. It will smother the gills of fish. It will smother the rocks that they live amongst. It will smother the food that they eat. And it will smother um, the breeding spaces. So those little fish can't move, breed, feed. Well, breathe, you know, so it's, it's pretty problematic to them. So what we wanted to do was grab some of those fish as an insurance population and take them to our aquarium in Heidelberg and look after them until their habitat recovered. But you don't just go in and do that to a community like Marysville that's in that kind of traumatic situation. And it was a crime scene. So, you know, we needed to work with the local police, we needed to work with the local community, we needed to work with a lot of people to get access to that site to collect those fish. So all these things are happening, you know, in parallel. And I remember um, watching a presentation by Rob Gordon, who has a role with our department and many others in advising us on how to think about psychological principles when dealing with fire affected communities. And some of the things that Rob said really resonated with me and I realised that it would be really important to integrate some of those principles in the way that we want to work with the Marysville community if we want to go in there and, for goodness sake, talk about fish. So, so that's how I've come to that point. This is how I've come to the point of starting from working on fish to working on a really deeply thoughtful approach to emergencies, recovery and resilience in communities and how that, what that means in terms of their nature connectedness as well. So, so Fern, you might just be about to do this, but you've had all of those um, pretty challenging and stressful experiences in 2009, both in your paid capacity, but also as a resident of the area. Um, jump ahead 11 years to the Black Summer fires, um, can you talk about, and if I've interrupted where you were going, please carry on, but I'm really interested to know then, 11 years on and all the things that you've learned, how you've been able to bring all of that rich knowledge and wisdom from 2009 through to the work that you're doing now. Well, 2019-20 fires um, really pretty much took us straight back to 2009 yeah. in the sense that here we go again. Yeah. Here we go again in um, a landscape that is massively whacked by fire and some particular communities that are also very much affected by fire. One of the things that was really different 
was the visibility of the environmental impact. So I think a big contributor to that might have been social media. So all of you would have seen massive threads of burnt koalas, um, burnt kangaroos, all of those things which triggered a really um, oh, important and powerful um, response from the broader community about the environmental impact of those fires. So there was even more uh, impetus for why we would want to connect the community with, with what is happening with the environmental impacts of those fires. In terms of how we addressed the environmental impact last year, um, I'm really proud of the response that happened. It was incredibly uh, collaborative. You know, many of the key organisations came together within days of um, the New Year's Eve focus event, I guess, and we began to workshop really quickly. What are the biggest threats? What are the things most at risk? What are the most important things that we need to do? And building on what we had learned in 2009 and indeed what we learned in 2006 as well. You know, there's layers and layers of learning here. It's not just 2009, but in previous other fires, we have learned and learned and learned and we will keep learning things that we can do to really effectively um, understand the most important threats and the most important things that we need to do for the environment. But at the same time, I was in those workshops saying, yes, this is great and this is what we need to do for the fish and the possums and the everything. We also mustn't forget the people in this equation. We mustn't forget the things that we learned in 2009 about the power of connecting people with the environment around them. And one of the things that we knew by 2019 was that the powerful connections that we built post-fire after Black Saturday were still persisting. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, although we thought that we were probably doing all the right things for the right reasons in 2009, I was hopeful that one of those reasons would mean longevity of advocacy, that people would form connections with those rivers and those fishes and those different things that would support them well into the future. And by 2019, we knew that that was true because we'd seen it. We'd seen how the community had taken on caring for, loving and protecting, um, for example, the bard collapses in the Marysville community where they have, you know, they've, there's a studio there now called Little Fishes. They've got little braille plates in the playground. There was an art installation about those fish. The kinder kids have written a song about those fish. That community has taken on what that fish means to them. And we have witnessed that... Um, it has helped their recovery because they have, there's a few things that have happened. One is that getting connected with what happened with the fish helped them get connected with stories of hope and recovery because as the fish started to come back and we put the fish back in the stream and we kept sharing stories of how the habitat was recovering, that gave people a sense of hope and recovery in their own context. It gave people a sense of connectedness with nature and it gave people a sense of connectedness with their own community because we used the fish story to bring the community together through a whole host of different events that appealed to different sectors of the community. And the other thing that we really deliberately did was give people a sense of agency and control. So we got them involved in things like um, helping do um, larval surveys for fish, you know, to help us find out which fish were recovering where and where, um, where they were breeding so we could focus some of our habitat repair work. We got them involved in designing an interpretive bridge in the middle of Marysville. And if you go there, you can see that big bridge and walk across it. It tells the story of those little fishes. So we gave them, you know, all sorts of people. So we gave artists, bridge builders, kids, a sense of control in what that fish means in their community into the future. So those key elements of, you know, a, a calmness in our approach, a sense of agency, a sense of hope, a sense of recovery, 
a sense of connectedness with each other and connectedness with the environment. They're all things that Rob Gordon said we should consider. They're all things that we actively integrated in 09. And by 2019, we had seen how those things had contributed to long-term recovery of people and advocacy for nature. So in those workshops after the 1920 fires, I was in there saying, we've got to do this again. <laughs> Please, can we do this again? <laughs> I mean, the, And the Fern, other... can I just jump in there and prompt you? I may or may not be wrong, but what I heard was you'd think because of all of the evidence you had about how much Connection to Nature had supported recovery in 2009, it would have been an easy sell. But was this hard for you to convince the funders and the planners to include nature-based recovery in the, in the state plans. How hard was that to convince them? It was much harder than it should have been. Yeah. And that's partly, I think, because of persisting silos in decision-making, in funding, in agencies. So the contexts in which I was arguing for this were environmental recovery, you know, biodiversity recovery workshops. So although I was arguing that this was in the interests of biodiversity, because it would build people's sense of advocacy and their actions for nature into the future, it wasn't an immediate recovery action. You know, it was that can come later. We don't need to worry about that. But we know that the earlier that you engage people in these stories, the more powerful it will be and the more effective it will be, both for the biodiversity and for the people. So I had to argue long, hard and bring in allies and allies helped a lot in persuading others who also have influence. So, you know, it's, it's, I guess that's one of the rules of how you have impact and influence, isn't it? If you're not having it in your own line, find allies who can go around <laughs> and be persuasive, persuasive in their fields of influence. So I did that. And um, ultimately, we did receive support to do similar work for the communities that are affected this time. And so um, for those that aren't aware, and we have got people coming, will be listening to this from uh, all sorts of places, the Victorian State Government's Bush, Bush Fire Biodiversity Response and Recovery Plan has seven themes. And one of those themes which Fern is talking about is nature-led community recovery. So there has been a commitment to, um, to investing time, energy and resources into this process that Fern is talking about, um, a recovery um, through connection with nature of people. So bringing together the people part with the nature stuff. So success, Fern. Um, so tell us about that theme. Well, that's right. It is called nature-led community recovery. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited that it is an actual proper theme <laughs> and we got some resources and I'm excited for lots of reasons. One is that it will mean that we can do this work with those affected communities. And I believe it will be important for them and the conversations that we've been having with them in place um, already help reassure me that this is helpful and people want this and that this will have the impact that we want for people. Another reason that I'm really excited is that I want this to become embedded as next practice in the way that we do recovery and resilience. I want this to be a standard way that we work with communities, not just after emergency events, but in the longer term to help build recovery, sorry, to build resilience in those communities as they become more connected with nature. The other thing that I really want to do, and I think will support it becoming next practice, is to build the evidence base. So, you know, after 09, our team, did not have the resources to actually evaluate the effectiveness of what we did. The team at Melbourne Uni did this beautifully. They did um, analyze the power of connectedness with nature as a recovery mechanism post 2009. So that's a really important paper that's worth looking up and we've been pointing to that and also pointing at some work that Tidball and others have done in the States. But we, we want to build that evidence base here in Victoria to be able to persuade 
decision makers in the future that this is um, an approach that is really worth integrating as a uh, business as usual practice into into future events um, and we won't just use evidence in a you know quantitative empirical sense we also will use story case study those sorts of things to um, to provide a compelling case for nature-led recovery um, yeah, grant um, recovery being a thing into the future. Yeah. I should say that one of the mechanisms that we're also using is a small grants program. So tell us about the grants. That's interesting. Yeah. So um, going back to those points around agency and connectedness, we really want to generate those amongst communities and have them devise the, their own ideas and you know project develop their own small projects for activities that will build their own sense of agency in helping their helping nature recover in witnessing nature recover sharing stories of nature recovery and having some kind of uh, legacy impact in their communities as well so we have grants and the zoos Vic have been fabulous in this process in being first to put their hand up and say here's funding to resource this we believe in this we want to make this happen so bravo to zoos victoria for being absolute leaders in making this happen um, but we're working really actively in a great collaboration there the funding people people in fire affected communities will be able to apply for up to five thousand dollars so these are not big grants these are little things that people want to do or which they could add on to something that they're doing in another context. And they'll be able to, they might be able to do things like um, a nature recovery walk, like hold, hold some walks in which they do a walk and talk and help people see and learn about how nature's recovering or, you know, an interpretation trail that has that sort of, um, you know, has information that's there in a static way so people can come back and, and see that and, and learn those things. Um, there might be environmental artwork. You know, we're, we're not saying that, um, you know, you, we are really keen actually on exploring the opportunities for art to effectively tell the stories of nature recovery. We think that can be really compelling. I, because of my time in the desert and the wet tropics, I have a real passion for citizen science and how that can also build agency and connectedness. And I would love to see some small citizen science projects in which people monitor, track and report on how nature is recovering. Um, so, you know, all those sorts of things. We really want to see people say, hey, I'd really love to do this in my community. I know that there are people here who would love to hear about this. Um, some small funds would really help. Um, let me go ahead. And, and one of the things that we're adding to that is the opportunity for people to get advice. So the zoos are also part of this again. So zoos, us at ARI, uh, botanist at the Royal Botanic Gardens, you know, a whole host of experts are basically standing by, <laughs> uh, available to provide advice to people about what might the best things be to be, or how could we do this in a way that really has meaning? What's the most impactful thing we could do? How could we really make a difference for nature in the place that we live? So those people are standing by to provide advice as well. So, so I'm really excited about it. Yeah, Fern, Marilee's asked a question and I'm going to ask it with you and tie it in um, because you're sort of touching on it now. Marilee's asked, I'd love to know more about how, how in uppercase, you get communities on board with this nature-led recovery. How did you get buy-in? Did the community drive parts of the decision-making, et cetera? So perhaps if um, you could talk a little bit about how we are, how this project is rolling out on the ground in terms of being truly community-led and um, tying it in with a question which, which I had at the start, which there's a lot of people that want to do something but don't know what's the most important thing or how to access that information. So providing access to the, the expert advice is important, but just how are we getting communities um, motivated and involved or did we have to try? Did it just come naturally? Mm, I think it's a bit of both. So, yeah. so we have quite a few people that do contact us and say, I wanna help, I wanna help. 
what do I do? So there are people who are proactive about this and write to us, particularly, you know, friends of groups, those sorts of things. They write to us or they write to local reps and ask them those questions. So we are deeply committed to um, place-based community-led action here. So we're working with Bushfire Recovery Victoria to connect with the hub coordinators who are in these places. And we're working with them to encourage them to give visibility to this program with people in those communities and say, hey, here's an opportunity for you. So it's working both ways. So people are coming into those hub coordinators and saying, I'm kind of interested in doing this. And the hub coordinators can say, well, here's an opportunity that matches what you want to do. And they're also pushing it out and saying, hey, has anyone thought about doing this? We're also um, jumping in or piggybacking on events that are happening around those districts. So, for example, today um, there is an event happening up at Dandongadale in the northeast where some Macquarie perch from Lake Dartmouth are being released into the Upper Buffalo to help um, boost the population that was affected by fires there. And that is a community focused event. Tungarong are there, some other local community events are there. It's all about helping people see how the local fish community are being boosted and helped. And at that event, we're not, we're not taking over that event in any way, but we are just um, having a presence there and saying, oh, you know, and here's a call to action. If anyone is, you know, inspired by any of this stuff and you want to do something else, here's an opportunity to learn more. Um, and even take up some action yourself if you'd like to apply for the grant. So we're looking for those opportunities where other activities are happening and we're jumping in and sharing information about this, um, this opportunity. Um, Amanda, you were part of an event that we did run. So this wasn't one that we jumped on. We actually delivered an event ourselves down at Forest Tech near Lakes Entrance about a month ago. Uh, this was called Sharing Stories of Nature Recovery. Um, and we brought together all kinds of people to share exactly that, stories of nature recovery. And we we had people talking about, you know, scientific biodiversity recovery from a, you know agency perspective. We had people talking about it from a, um, a sort of journaling perspective. We had people talking about it from um, a reading and healing country, um, Indigenous perspective. We had, a, we had some kids there talking about a photo project they've been doing. We had all kinds of different people talking about what nature recovery means for them and what they've been noticing and what they've been doing. And we had a few people at that event, but of course it is still COVID times kind of, so we couldn't have a packed house. But we shared that event to some satellite hubs in Malakuta and Sarsfield. And as Amanda's put in the chat there, there's now a playlist of all of the recordings. And in a way, we think that that will be even more impactful than the event itself, because those recordings are now going far and wide into a whole lot of other people's lounge rooms and studies and phones. And they're looking at those things and going, oh, that's interesting. You know, I could do something a bit like that. So those are little catalyst videos to help people think about the things that they might do. Yeah. So we're running some events. We're piggybacking on other events. We're using the hub coordinators to share the news. We're responding to people who are coming to us and, and just trying to get the stories out there as much as we can, that this is an opportunity that we'd love to work with people on. And how confident are you, Fern, that we are going to come out of this process with some rigorous um, monitoring and evaluation to, to put some um, evidence, little e, um, behind how this is successful? So this is rolled out in the future as um, a standard recovery process. How, how Do you think you're going to have to keep fighting? Or, I mean, you know, we've talked about this uh, offline in our, in our day job capacity, how absolutely committed we are to ensuring there is some rigor around the monitoring evaluation process so that we don't have to fight like you did each time. Have you got confidence that we're going to be able to do that? 
Well, it's a double barreled question. Yeah. I have, I have confidence that we can do rigorous, reasonably <laughs> rigorous evaluation on this. Um, you know, there, there are a number of questions that we're really interested in. Some of them, um, I'm confident we will be able to evaluate successfully. Some of them, um, I think we'll be kind of breaking new ground a little bit. But I am interested in the power of nature to help people recover. Yes. I'm interested in the power of how those psychological principles linked with nature recovery support people. And I'm interested in the actual outcomes um, for people. So do, do people actually take up the grants? Do they do the things that they said they would? And what happens with those? Do, do we get those sort of legacy outcomes that we're looking for? So that's a quite pragmatic one that I think is pretty easy to evaluate. Some of those questions around the recovery impact of this work will be a little bit harder. The second part of your question was, will that evidence help us make this business as usual practice into the future? Yeah. Um, I'm optimistic, but I can't be fully confident because, um, because of the same barriers that have been in place in the past, that we do have some silos in decision-making and in funding. But I am also optimistic that particularly in the realm of disaster and resilience thinking and practice and in places like Australia, there is an increasing recognition that silos don't work. There's an increasing recognition that a multidiscipline and even transdisciplinary approach is really important in community resilience. And that if, you know, next time, whenever that might be, I'm hoping that we have progressed in a substantial way along that path to a more connected, joined up approach in what resilience really needs. So I'm optimistic, yeah. but it depends how soon it happens. <laughs> well, we don't want it to happen, you know, obviously too soon because that would mean another crisis and disaster, but which sort of a segue in and, and feel free to, to type your um questions in the chat box, everybody will put your hand up and Bridget will let you talk. But I'm really, I think there's such a strong link between resilience and preparedness. I'm really keen to talk to my local community, um, who, which hasn't been impacted by a bushfire for a while, but it will be. And I would love to really use that nature connection now in the preparedness phase so that we understand how important nature is and we do things now to protect it but also understand what our role is afterwards without having to spend sort of six months getting the grants and funding and approvals in the plans. So, so do you think that we can have a conversation parallel with the one in recovery now to also talk to communities in their preparedness conversations? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that that triggers in my mind is that one of the conversations that has come up again and again and again in this work and, I think it squarely fits in the preparedness context as well, is fire literacy. Yeah. So people understanding what does fire actually mean in the area that I live? And, and that really links to preparedness, being prepared for what, what will happen to nature around me and, and what will it look like next and what will it look like in a fire-sensitive stage and um, what does succession mean? And, you know, what can I expect from a fire perspective uh, in, in the place that I live? So I think fire literacy, particularly with respect to biodiversity, in, in, you know, from my perspective, will be important and helpful and not just in helping people be prepared psychologically, but also in terms of how they um, understand what's going to happen to nature and what that means in how they then notice nature recovery, as you say, straight ahead, like straight away, that it won't take us to come in, yeah. you know, and go, oh, you know, who's noticing nature? But that people will go, oh, yeah, look. There's the epicormic buds. Yeah. Ne yeah. Next, I'll start to see the kangaroo apple, and then I'll see all the wattles, and then it'll get super thick, 
and then it'll start to sort itself out and oh look it's doing just what I expected so people knowing that stuff and be connected with it also kind of gives them a sense of agency because they have an expectation and understanding and they know what to see and when it happens they feel more in control of it because it's not oh my god it's changing again what on earth is going on around me I don't understand it yeah I think that's such an important point the sense of control that you get when you see what you expect and you know what's coming um, is so reassuring and going back to those principles of um of um, you know resilience, I guess you called it, which was calmness, hope, and self-efficacy and control. Um, Kath Cooney is on the line, Fern, and she and I are both um, volunteers with the Red Cross, and we train our volunteers in psychological first aid. And those words that you use are the words that we use to train people in psych first aid. And we say, you know, the sooner you um, support people with hope, calm, safety, um, connectedness, and self-efficacy, the sooner you know, the better their recovery will be. Um, and I always think that if we can start people on their journey of recovery before they've been impacted, i.e. resilience or preparedness, the better. And I really hope that COVID, that one of the lessons we've learned from COVID is that we really value nature and time in nature. And therefore, let's think about it now and, and connect to it and protect it and talk about it. Um, so, look, I'm, I really hope that we can have some conversations around nature-based community preparedness and resilience as we do this recovery project. Well, well, one more point that I would make about that, Amanda, is that I think one of the other things COVID has taught us is that we are pretty much always in trauma and that those principles and those needs for nature connectedness are always necessary and with us now and important always. Yeah, they are. And I, I guess we can take it for granted, right? Um, we take nature which is around us all the time for granted and when we lose it we really grieve it. I'm just going to read to you if you can't see it Fern Anne's comment. As a, as a citizen scientist who contributes wildlife observations to several platforms, well done Anne, I find the more I do this the more I appreciate the biodiversity around me even in the middle of a city. The more I look the more I see and this gives me more commitment to preserving biodiversity. So Fern, could you just touch on some of the apps that are around, talk about citizen science, because I've become obsessed with a couple of them too, and thanks to you and our recent trip, field trip in um, <laughs> Eskipland. So what are some of the apps that people can get on their phones now and start looking and recording nature behaviour? Oh, please do. Please do. And thank you, Anne. And I'm cheering and waving my arms in the air in big cheery ways and saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Good on you. And you're so right that it, for some people it becomes a bit addictive, I think, and the more you do it, the more you want to do it. Absolutely. Which, one you, which ones do you like? Oh, Frog ID, Kate, yes. Uh, yeah, well, um, Frog ID was actually going to be top of my list, so yeah, yeah. definitely Frog ID. Yeah, mine too. Um, I'm a recent convert. Uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> yep, yay for Frog ID. I love Frog ID. And um, it's easy to use. Um, you get information back. You learn a lot. It's fun. It's got great visuals. It's really good. Go for frogs. How um, about iNaturalist? Well, that was going to be my second one. <laughs> so an iNaturalist I love because you can get, you can put anything in there. And one of the things as a, um, as a Victorian DELP employee, I particularly love iNaturalist because the data eventually ends up in the Victorian Biodiversity at, um, Atlas. So all those data that people put into iNaturalist and the ALA, the, um, what's the ALA actually stand for? Australia, oh, should know that, Atlas, Australian Land. Anyway, the ALA, which is linked with iNaturalist, all of that ultimately comes into the VBA as well. Atlas Living Australia, that's it. Yeah. Atlas all Living. of that. Thank you, Anne. Um, they all come into our... Um, Victorian atlas so those data make a difference they really make a difference so they're my top two and number three would be um, the bird data one so bird data is the bird life Australia one and bird life Australia do all kinds of great bird things like the backyard bird count um, or, or there's there's so many different things you can do with bird life um, jump on there and join in and again you learn a lot you contribute a lot and it makes a big difference. We are one, one of the papers that I love to talk about in terms of citizen science is about bird data. So bird observers 
from, I think, eight countries submitted um, records of these migratory shorebirds for 30 years. Wow. And they helped us understand that the Yellow Sea mudflats in China were collapsing and the most critical place for habitat for this suite of migratory shorebirds that were collapsing. And that international effort created this paper, which drove to this massive shift in how that site is managed and recognised, or other way around, recognised and managed. So yay for citizen scientists and their fabulous effort, and particularly their fabulous collective effort. Like it, it just, it honestly makes a difference. It really does. There's all sorts of things that we draw on citizen science data for, because they can be in places that we can't, at times that we can't, and it's just brilliant. So please go for it. Use um, iNaturalist, Prog ID, bird data. And if you want to jump on the um, Australian Citizen Science Association website, it also has a list of a whole heap of useful apps and links and all those things. There is also a Victorian chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. We, we are very active in um, supporting that chapter and there's stuff on their website as well that's useful. And even on our ARI website, we've got um, a few things about citizen science that people might have um, might find interesting. Fern, do you want to do a quick plug, because we've got a couple of minutes left, a quick plug for SWIFT. Do you think that might be of interest um, to people listening in and if they want to sign up to the newsletters? Well, definitely. And definitely in the context of citizen science as well. So people probably have never heard of SWIFT. And I'm going to, I'm going to write it in the chat as you talk. Yeah. So double F. <laughs> yes, I've got that. <laughs> it's an acronym for statewide um, integrated flora fauna teams, which I know sounds ridiculous, but it has a history um, that we're not going to go into now. But anyway, <laughs> SWIFT is... It's not a government site. It's a collaborative sort of consortia, if you like. It's a bunch of different organisations that look after SWIFT. And it's a place for community groups to share their nature stories and their nature projects. And there are a couple of places there which are actively about citizen science. It's not just about Victoria, but it does have a focus on Victoria, I guess. But it is really about things all around the country. And there's a page there specifically about fire recovery projects in East Gippsland. And it's using iNaturalist as well, although you can also just aim, email things to the person who's running that project. And we have all sorts of citizen science things on SWIFT. So one of the meetings I had today was about how we're about to launch a new part of our Southern right whale citizen science project on SWIFT. Um, so, people take photos of southern right whales that they see off the coast and they submit those photos to SWIFT. Those photos go into this national catalogue of whales. And last year, citizen scientists' efforts helped us identify 39 new mother calf pairs and helped us realise that those animals are moving in ways that we hadn't previously understood so yay for citizen scientists in all kinds of contexts and yes yeah, swift we're trying to really give it some visibility as a place to find out for all sorts of things they have regular seminars there was one on today oh, i missed that one today so we're out of time now and we like to keep these to time so look i've really enjoyed um listening to your fish's story fish lady um and i hope we get to have another lemonade soon at the pub um, you know, I hope, I hope from the conversation today that people have uh, agree with Fern and I in that the absolute critical role that nature plays in supporting communities in not just their recovery, but also living every day and general life resilience. Um, and if you do want some further information, look up those links and I'll, I'll post some links um, in the write up in the next um, Women in Emergencies newsletter as well, so you can access them as well. Thank you so much, Fern, for taking the time. And, and I'm sorry that uh, your office is not internet um, friendly, but um, you've been so interesting to listen to and so much more to do. And I really wish you and, and me and us all the success <laughs> that we can actually support communities in a really um, valuable and meaningful way in their recovery in this, this long journey. 
Um, and are you okay? I have actually put your LinkedIn um, link on the promotion for this event. Are you happy for people to get in touch with you um, um, if they've got some further questions or, or questions that they want um, in leading forward? Of course, Amanda. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry about the connectivity issues no, at the start okay. of this. It was really messy. But um, of course, I'm really happy to chat with any yeah, of you. It's a fabulous great. organization, fabulous conversation. Thanks so much for bringing yeah, me. No, up. you're welcome. And I have the pleasure of working with you now quite a bit. So I'm, I'm very lucky, but I really want to bring all of your beautiful stories and wisdom to a really broad audience. And being the fabulous woman that you are, I, uh, I want to bring women's wisdom to other women. So thanks all for joining. Uh, thanks for bearing with us with the technology. Thanks, Marley. Marley, Thank you. And, um, we will see you again soon. And, and Fern, all the best. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Amanda, I'm just staying on for one minute just to read the chat. Yeah, very good. That's cool. Thank <laughs> you. Thank oh, you. Well, Sorry about that. That's okay. I do love your Fisher's story. It just makes me, yeah, it makes me happy that people, um, I don't know, it can almost see the bigger picture like we're not disconnected from nature and it's not just about getting their home rebuilt but their actual life and their happiness in life means nature too not just the physical things um, yeah absolutely yeah yep it's real it's a yeah. thing yeah thanks Kate yeah I'm sure it'll all be fine um and Fern I don't know whether we'll touch base before you go off on your beautiful leave um but I'm sure we will. I'm sure we'll speak before you go. We will. Yeah, I'm sure we'll speak sometime next week. There's a few things to to sort of tidy up before I go and leave. So definitely, yeah. yeah. yeah and great. good luck with you. Like, are yeah. you hobbling? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm a oh. mess. I'm an absolute